And this year the museum is honoring the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 8 mission and the accomplishments of its crew, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. Uh, not just because of the occasion tonight, but I've said this repeatedly, I think the Apollo 8 mission is one of the most important missions uh, of the whole NASA experience. And I don't say that just because we're here tonight. It was a very, very unusual mission about which we'll hear a, a lot later on. The mission departed December 21st and returned December 28th, 1968. It was the first time that humans left the vicinity of Earth and traveled to uh, another world. And I think the things that we'll, we'll have, we'll hear them describe this evening will show what faith they had in the engineers and the people they were working with and the crew and the team and the equipment and everything else. And we will be hearing a great deal about the mission, but let me just set the stage with a few historical facts. Apollo 8 was not originally planned as a moon mission. NASA's plan was to do an Earth orbital mission. But in September 1968, the Soviets sent Zond 5 to pass by the moon. It carried and returned to Earth a payload of turtles, wine flies, and mealworms. Now that's quite a character. Now, I don't know if there's any similarity between those three types of cargoes and the ones that occurred later on when the U.S. sent them up or not, but uh, Borman, Lovell, and Anders were a step up from turtles, wine flies, and mealworms. There's no doubt about that. And it carried, when it brought them back to Earth, of course, the USSR repeated the feat in November with Zon 6. The space race competition to land humans on the moon, the goal set by President Kennedy in 61, seemed to be heating up considerably. And after the successful Earth orbit mission of Apollo 7, the time seemed right for a bolder, a riskier mission, a voyage to the moon. Reportedly, even the Apollo 8 astronauts rated their chances of success at no better than 50-50 they're willing to go. Before Apollo 8, the U.S. had flown only 17 missions in space, only 17, and only 22 different astronauts before that had gained spaceflight experience. Of those, Apollo 8 Commander Frank Borman and Command Module Pilot Jim Lovell had flown more hours than any other astronauts. Indeed, together, they had more hours than all Soviet cosmonauts combined. They flew together on Gemini 7, a two-week endurance test in which they lived together in a cabin the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. After recovery, Jim Lovell joked, I want to announce our engagement. <laughs> it's my understanding, too, from uh, rumors going around that the sanitary conditions would not have passed OSHA minimums. <laughs> they were ready for Apollo 8. So, too, was Bill Anders, William Anders, making his very first flight he graduated with the Naval Academy, an experienced pilot, recipient of a master's degree in nuclear engineering. He served as lunar module pilot for the mission. Unfortunately for him, the mission did not carry a lunar module. <laughs> engineering problems had delayed its availability. But then this uh, next statement may be a little bit controversial to some of the crew beside uh, Bill Anders, but as Apollo 8 orbited the moon, Bill had to be content with making one of the most historic photographs of the 20th century, the incomparable image of the Earth rising over the lunar surface. There'll be a little contention on that, perhaps. The public build-up to Apollo 8 was tremendous. A worldwide audience anticipated the mission. Launched just before the Christmas holidays, the mission balanced the tension of the space race with a transcendent feeling that the accomplishment was truly for all humanity. Live television broadcast by the astronauts while orbiting the moon brought the adventure to almost a quarter of all people living on Earth, by best estimates. And the, the very memorable Christmas Eve scripture reading is something that none of us that heard that at that time, including many of you here, will ever, ever forget. The success of the mission paved the way a few months later for Apollo 11, for Neil, Buzz, Mike going to the moon, landing of humans on the moon, fulfilling President Kennedy's challenge to the nation. So it's really my pleasure not only to be here tonight, but uh, to look forward to hearing uh, some of the recounting of what happened on Apollo 8. And it's my pleasure to welcome the Apollo 8 astronauts and Dr. Martin Collins, curator in the museum's Division of Space History. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you.
maybe a place to, to begin here is, is to ask Frank to, to, to give us a little bit of a sense of how the idea for the Apollo 8 mission uh, uh, began uh, and how it sort of took shape in the months of, of uh, the summer months of 1968. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and thank you all for being here, and John, for your generous introduction. I, we, we were assigned to the <coughs> excuse me third Apollo mission. It was supposed to have been a, a long uh, duration, relatively long durations, exercising the lunar module and command module in Earth orbit out to 8,000 miles. And then in December, while well, we were out at, uh, at Downey, California, going through the systems with the spacecraft, I got a call from Deke Slayton, our boss, who said, come back. We've had a change in uh, plans. And he informed me that the uh, CIA had informed NASA that they uh, would be a <clears throat> probably be a Soviet attempt to go around the moon before the end of the year. And they wanted to know if we could, this was in August, they wanted to know if we could uh, change our mission, train, and, and be able to go. I immediately said yes, because I knew that Bill and, and Jim would have, a, you know, were dying for the chance to do this, and then we came back. And, and we've, you've had the outline of what happened after that. But interestingly enough, the, the saga of Apollo 8 really should begin, or the Apollo program should begin with a fire in January of uh, 1967. It killed three astronauts, threw the whole program into disarray. And uh, out, of that, out of that terrible tragedy, I'm convinced, came the, the genesis of, of the Apollo program that was so successful. Part of the decision that was made when Frank went uh, to Houston and Bill and, Ann, uh, Bill and I were still out at Downey wondering what happened to Frank uh, was uh, the fact that the decision would go on Apollo 8 to the moon if Apollo 7 was successful. So in reality, that flight proved the improvements of the command module from the disastrous fire that we had in 1967. Uh, and that was the spur that allowed us to make that final decision after Apollo 7 to say, yes, let's go. Although we were training for the lunar, lunar mission prior to the Apollo 7 flight. And that flight was successful because Frank, you know, uh, spent an awful lot of time making sure that command module was safe. You know, John was awful generous in saying how important Apollo 8 was, and then, and then uh, Bill just mentioned Apollo 7 being so important. But in reality, every damn flight was important. You know, think, think of John Glenn sitting on top of an ICBM, uh, really in, in an aluminum inner tube, uh, <laughs> because it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't hold it without air. Isn't that correct? You had to have pressure in that thing or you had to clap. So NASA's program wasn't haphazard. It didn't just, it didn't just happen. It was planned every step of the way, and it was remarkable uh, that, it, that it worked. I think I honestly believe that God was, uh, was shining on us from the, from the very beginning. We had to start learning the, uh, the, the lunar surface of the moon's topography to uh, see the various craters. And this was sort of interesting because we brought in people who were familiar with that to teach us uh, some of the initial points because the mission of Apollo 8 was really uh, to check the navigation, uh, and to check for suitable landing spots, uh, the flat areas, the mare, or the sea, that uh, would give the people who would attempt the first landing the greatest chance of survival. And consequently, our photography and looking around at those flat areas, like the Sea of Tranquility, which uh, Apollo 11 eventually landed on, uh, that, that was one of our missions, and that was part of our training. Uh, and also, we had to do things that uh, in a three-dimensional effect, uh, navigation was one of them because we are not going around the Earth anymore. Uh, we are going to have to test out uh, the navigation system on the way to the moon to see how accurate it was. And this, of course, was the, the test flight of that, of that particular aspect.